Okay, thanks. Oh. Yes. Okay, okay. So thanks very much, uh, Ken, for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here in Erichi. I was here 25 years ago. And when Bill told me, oh, some years ago, that he was planning on organizing this school, I was absolutely de de delighted to hear that uh, I was also on his list. So I uh, will start by wishing you as much fun as I had 25 years ago at this school. Now I have to start by acknowledging my co-author. Uh, Christian and I have uh, worked together for the last 20 odd years. And over the years, we've borrowed each other's files, data, slides, ideas, such that we ourselves no longer know who did what when. And uh, so it's easier in the end to say we're just a team. And uh, that means that I can blame him for everything that I get wrong here today. So, we all know that if you have a powder and uh, you put it in an X-ray beam, you're going to get a powder pattern, and that's an easy experiment. What is less intuitively obvious is how you get from this one-dimensional powder pattern to a three-dimensional structure. And of course, this is why you're here, or at least one of the reasons you're here, is to find out how you do that. And uh, my job today is really just to put it all in context. You're going to hear all the gory details from other people. They have that nasty job of taking you through all the mathematics. I have the nice job of just telling you what it's all about. Um, if we look at the number of structures that have been solved from powder data over the years, I've stolen this slide from Armel Labile on a chapter in 2008. Unfortunately, it only goes up to 2006, but it doesn't really matter because you can see there's a steady increase in the number of structures that have been published that have been solved from powder data. And why is that? Well, Bill has already said, really, it's because we've got uh, better data, we've got better computers, and we've got algorithms that take advantage of both. And this is really what this school is all about. So, I'm supposed to tell you about structure solution, give you an overview. Um, if there's a solution, that means there's a problem somewhere. So, maybe we should start with what is really the problem that we are trying to overcome. And this is especially for those who are relative newcomers to the field. And then the structure solution itself, there are several essential steps, and I will take you through them. And a lot of structure determination is all about making the right decisions. So uh, during the course of this, uh, these 10 days, hopefully you will learn that what are the right decisions for your particular problem. And then something brief about the algorithms, only uh, categorizing them, not going into any details. And then finally, we might be powder diffractionists, but there are a few other techniques around, and maybe we could take advantage of those as well. So that's the last part. But let's start with the problem. What is this problem we're trying to solve? We all know if you take a single crystal, put it in an X-ray beam, 
you'll get a diffraction pattern, has nice clean spots. You can index these spots. Uh, you don't have all the problems that Peter Stevens has just told you about for the uh, powder case. In single crystal case, you have nice three-dimensional data. You can give these uh, spots indices, HKL, and you can measure their intensities. And now a quick crystallography lesson. Those intensities are proportional to the square of what we call the structure factor. The structure factor is simply a summation over all the atoms in your unit cell. So n atoms in the unit cell, they have some scattering power, which has to do with the number of electrons for the case of x-rays. And they are somewhere in the unit cell. They have coordinates. All the structural information is there in this structure factor. It's sometimes written in this form. And if we look at it in this form, you can think of it as a summation of vectors. If we look in imaginary and real space, uh, these vectors are in that space. Uh, for each atom, we have a vector. It has an amplitude, which has to do with the number of electrons, and has a phase, which has to do with where it sits in the unit cell. And we have one of these little vectors for every atom in the structure. And our structure factor is simply the summation. And the structure factor has an amplitude, and it has a phase. So we're all on the same page now, I hope. The nice thing about structure factors is if you have the structure factors, you can calculate an electron density map. And of course, if you've got an electron density map, you know where the electrons are, so you know where the atoms are. You know how many electrons each type of atom has, then you know which element is where in your unit cell. So what's the problem? Well, we don't have the structure factors. We have the structure factor amplitudes. We do not have their phases. And this is the phase problem in crystallography. This is the problem that has to be solved also in single crystal crystallography. Uh, if you're lucky and you have a centrosymmetric structure, the phase has no imaginary part, and so it's only zero or pi, plus or minus. If uh, you're a little unlucky, then sorry, it can be anything between zero and two pi. So all about structure analysis is about solving this phase problem. So that's problem number one. Single crystal people, though, have pretty well solved this phase problem for single crystal data for actually relatively large molecules or structures. OK, powder diffraction. We also have single crystals. They're just a little bit smaller. They're about a million times smaller than our normal single crystals. And so our diffraction pattern is a million times weaker. We have good detectors these days. And so what's the problem? Well, in a powder, you usually don't have a crystal all by itself. You'll have another one also in the beam, differently oriented, contributing its little diffraction pattern to the whole. And you'll have another one and another one. And your sample just consists of a whole lot of these little crystallites, all with their individual diffraction patterns. I've only got 10 crystallites there. 
Uh, you don't have 10 crystallites in your sample. You have the order of a million, all differently oriented. And so the result is this, which you've uh, seen before. In three dimensions, these are concentric spheres. And when we measure a powder diffraction pattern, it goes from the center to the outside. So radial uh, measurement. And it doesn't matter which direction you measure. You can have your sample any which way in the beam. You'll get the same diffraction pattern. So that's nice. That means it's good for identification. Um, the problem, of course, you can see if I now overlay the single crystal pattern. And just concentrate on these four reflections. They all have approximately the same distance from the origin. They have approximately the same 2 theta value. They are under the same peak in the powder diffraction pattern. So we have these four reflections and we only have the sum of their intensities. If we only have the sum of the intensities, uh, we have an ambiguity in the individual intensities. And this is what is known as the reflection overlap problem. One of the real problems is that I said for single crystal data, the phase problem is more or less solved. But those solutions to the problem are based on knowing the intensities. That you at least have that. And we don't have that with powders. And so we've got a double problem. OK. So how do we solve it? Uh, some years ago at that conference, uh, that Peter Stevens showed in 1995. Uh, it was a workshop on structure determination from powder data. Eventually, a book came out of that conference. A few years later, it was 2002. <laughs> um, Ken showed the cover. And Christian, Bill, Ken, and I at that time came up with the idea of describing the structure solution process as wending your way through a maze. And I still like the analogy, so that's how I'm going to present it here today. We basically have to find our way from a sample to the crystal structure. And there's a maze of possibilities. It starts with the sample. And you will be hearing various talks during the course of this uh, school on inor inorganics, organics, proteins, uh, pharmaceuticals, magnetic materials. We have lots of different materials, and they all come with their own individual uh, problems. So you have to know your sample. It is well worth spending time getting a good sample, even if it's not a single crystal, if it's highly crystalline, if it doesn't have an impurity. These are very important for the subsequent process. Uh, this is at the very beginning. It's worth investing a little bit of time here. We then have a decision to make. What kind of radiation should we use? Is the lab diffractometer good enough? It often is. Do we really need a synchrotron? A neutron's better. We have a school going on in parallel, all about electron diffraction. So you have to choose the best radiation for your uh, problem, and it will depend on the problem. And there are various talks 
on this tomorrow morning in particular, and Robert Dinabir on the last day, lab x-rays. Then you have to collect the data. How you collect the data is also extremely important. We've already heard it, something from Ken, uh, Kenneth on this, and we will be hearing more on very specific types of data collection. Um, fast data collection under extreme conditions uh, for very spe specific parametric refinement and in situ uh, data collection. So you'll be hearing more on that. We know about indexing now, so I don't have to dwell on that. Space group determination is an essential part of that. At this point, we know where the reflections are in the pattern. We have a unit cell. We know the space group, so we know what's missing, if there are any systematic absences. So we know the positions of the reflections. And as we saw many examples just now, uh, you can then do an intensity extraction. And there are two ways of doing this. Uh, basically, the poly, which is a least squares refinement of the intensities, and labile, which is an iterative uh, process. And all of these programs, which you will be hearing about and watching how they're used, uh, will do some kind of intensity extraction. So that's a good place to get questions answered about that problem. But now we've got to do something about those overlapping reflections. Usually, we just equipartition. This is absolutely wrong, of course. We know that the intensities we're getting by equipartitioning are not the correct intensities. Um, but they're often good enough. But I think it's important that you realize that there are a couple of other alternatives to equipartitioning. And because there's no specific talk about that, I'm going to diverge a little bit. I'm going to jump out of the maze and talk a little bit about treating overlapping reflections. So equipartitioning, say you've got a peak like this, and under that peak, which we've measured, this blue one, there are actually three reflections uh, that we can't distinguish. And they have these intensities. When we equipartition, this is what we do, and you can see how wrong it is. Okay. So what else can we do? We don't know how to partition them. Well, there are a couple of approaches. There are some computational approaches which are based on looking at the non-overlapping reflections to say something about the overlapping reflections. Some clever people here. Uh, these triplets. Triplets, you know, you've heard of these in direct methods. You've got a triplet of reflections. They have related indices. And there's an equation called Sayre's equation, which relates these, the structure factors of these reflections. I can expand that so that we have amplitudes and phases. And the important thing, I'm not going to uh, go into this, what's usually done is we look at the phase relationships. But there are actually also some amplitude relationships, which you can also use. Just to get an estimate, it's not going to be very good, but it will be better than equipartitioning. So you mix 
reflections that are not overlapping with those which are overlapping and do some statistics uh, to get a good estimate of the overlapping reflections. Another possibility is called the fast iterative Patterson squaring method. If you take your amplitude squared, so now we have no phase problem, do a Fourier transform, get a Patterson map. The Patterson map from a powder pattern is not bad. But it's maybe not as sharp as it would be from a single crystal. So somewhat lower peaks, somewhat bumpier. But the strong peaks are strong peaks. These are interatomic vectors. They are, they are there. They can be depended upon. And so what this method does is take the Patterson map and square it. Every pixel is squared, so you're really emphasizing the strong peaks, de-emphasizing the weaker peaks, which may be noise. You then do a Fourier transform of this modified Patterson map. You get new Fourier coefficients. And these, of course, correspond to uh, our starting point, our amplitudes. Those which are not overlapping, you don't do anything about them. But you take the coefficients that were here to repartition the overlapping reflections. And it turns out that the direction of the change is correct, but not strong enough. And so there's also an extrapolation step involved. And so if you have enough non-overlapping reflections, you can do something about your overlapping reflections. And you go around and around until the statistics here approximate the statistics of your non-overlapping reflections. OK, so those are two methods if you don't have too many overlapping reflections. Let's say not more than 50%. What if you've got more than 50%? Well, we're not done. There are some experimental ways of approaching the problem. One exploits preferred orientation, and you'll be hearing about that later on this week um, from Christian. Another exploits anisotropic thermal expansion. When I was preparing this talk, I didn't know Ken was going to touch on this, so uh, we'll get another view of it. So what is this? And how can it help us with the overlap problem? Well, I'm a zeolite person, and so I've got a zeolite example instead of an organic. This is an aluminophosphate with an open channel system measured at room temperature. And zeolites in general, uh, or often, are made with organic templates. And you can burn these templates out without changing the framework structure. So if you do this with SAPO, 40, so heat it up to 600 degrees, you get a, a small change in the lattice parameters. So A is a bit bigger, B is a bit bigger, and C is actually a bit smaller. But the framework has not changed very much. And now look here. Here we have three reflections. Two of them are overlapping here. Here, they're separated. Simply because the lattice parameters have changed a little bit, the overlap pattern has changed. 
And so now we know that the two reflections under here are actually about equal intensities. If we look at another section, here we have overlapping reflections and a, quite a strong peak. And if we equal partition this, we would get it really wrong because it's actually a very weak peak next to a very strong peak. And so with just these two measurements, you can get a lot more information about the relative intensities of your overlapping reflections. Uh, this is a much more severe treatment than uh, that that Kenneth was talking about. That was for organics. Just a gentle tr heat treatment will change the lattice parameters enough so that you can do uh, this kind of, play this kind of game. Uh, with a relatively simple experiment. Okay, back to our maze. We're now here. We have a list of HKLs, we have a list of intensities, however we've got them. Now we can solve the structure. And there are lots of different ways of solving the structure, and you can see there are lots of talks and demonstrations uh, about this. This is the key, perhaps, to the whole uh, procedure. We can use single crystal methods. Remember, these are the ones that are using the intensities or the structure factor amplitudes. We can also do model building. Model building is a perfectly respectable way of solving a structure. And if you build a model, you then generate the powder diffraction pattern and compare it with your measured one. If you do that, you don't have to go through this business. Uh, you don't have to have the individual intensities. You can use the whole profile. And then a fairly new method on the scene is charge flipping. And we'll be hearing about that later on this week. OK. What's here? We now have a model for our structure. It's usually missing something. A solvent molecule, the carbon at the end of a wiggly chain, the template in a zeolite. We want to find that. And so we have to complete our model. And again, there's no specific lecture on this topic, so I'm going to jump out again. To complete a structural model, we do what we call difference electron density uh, analysis. You can calculate the total electron density by using this equation. You remember it, I'm sure. You use the measured amplitudes and the calculated structure factor phases. So we have a model. That means that we can calculate phases. Use those phases and the measured amplitudes. Uh, because you've got a model, you can also partition the, the amplitudes according to the model. And this is usually what is done. Okay, so then we have an electron density map. We can improve on that a little bit by saying, well, we can also calculate the electron density of the model that we're using. Uh, by using the calculated structure factor amplitudes and the calculated uh, phases. If we subtract this from that, we should get what's missing. Not only that, any truncation effects that are coming in because of the resolution of your data will be more or less subtracted out. So that's an added bonus. It's 
So we take the total electron density, subtract the model electron density, and we have what's missing. Isn't that nice? Let's go back to SAPO 40. This is the diffraction pattern. That's the measured one. And that is the diffraction pattern calculated for our framework structure, the aluminophosphate framework structure. It's missing the carbon and nitrogen and hydrogen of the template molecule. OK, so I'm going to do this uh, difference electron density map. In order to do that, I have to scale the patterns to one another. And you say, so what? Well, you just minimize the differences, right? OK, I'll minimize the differences. Here we are. This is taking those two patterns. How can I get the least differences? And then from this, I will generate the difference electron density map. There it is. Uh, the framework is buried in here in electron density. We're supposed to have subtracted that out. Here is what we're looking for. In order to find it, I had to reduce the electron density uh, contour level quite a long way, as these electron densities on the framework itself are stronger than this one. If we look at it from the other side, it looks like that. OK, let's go back to our scaling. These template molecules particularly affect the low angle reflections. If we take the high angle data, the high resolution data, this is where the framework is really having its say. And I use that section of the pattern to scale. Then my difference looks like this. So there's almost no difference at higher angles. But it's awful down here. And no respectable Rietveld program is going to give you that scale factor. Unless you say, I only want to do it from this point because your R value is awful. But these differences are the real differences. These are the differences that are telling you about the missing atoms. So, voila. Here is our, uh, I think it's a TPA molecule. And that's it from the side. Very clear, very easy to see. So if you're having trouble doing difference electron density maps, take a look at your scale factor. So we've almost made it to the middle. We just need to refine our structure now. And you've heard about how to do that. And you will hear more at the demonstrations. OK. I just want to say a few words about the algorithms that are used for structure solution. Um, because you're going to hear these expressions, and if you don't know what they mean, you think it's something very complicated, and it's really something very simple. There are what we call reciprocal space methods. These are simply the methods that work with the diffraction data. Your amplitudes and phases. 
sometimes referred to as phase space, working in phase space. These are direct methods which works with phase relationships uh, between the stronger reflections, expressed very, very simply. You will hear much more uh, from Carmela Giacovazzo. Patterson methods, this is generally referred to as the heavy atom method. It doesn't have to be a heavy atom, but it's the one that tells you about interatomic vectors. Maximum entropy, this is a way of getting your maximally unbiased phase set. These all work with diffraction data. These are single crystal methods. So you generate a model from the diffraction data, and then you check what comes out for chemical sense. So, whoops. You're using the chemical information in a passive way. Then we have the real space methods. The methods that work with atomic arrangements. This can be model building by hand. You just build a model that's consistent with everything you know. Or it can be model building by computer using global optimization algorithms, like simulated annealing or evolutionary algorithms. Whichever you use, you come up with a model, you then compare that diffraction pattern with the measured one, and you use the diffraction pattern in this case passively. And then finally, we have the hybrid methods which, of course, work in both spaces. This would be shake and bake, uh, something uh, started for macromolecular single crystallography, um, using direct methods in reciprocal space, and then an analysis of the electron density in real space. Focus, it's a zeolite-specific program, you use random starting phases attached to the intensities, and then a real space framework structure spa uh, search. Charge flipping. So again, you start with random starting phases, so you're in reciprocal space, and then perturb the electron density map, which comes out. That's in real space. So you're using the diffraction pattern and the chemical information actively. Okay. And since I'm running out of time, I was going to say something about focus. If you're interested in zeolites, uh, come to me later and I will tell you about focus. So we'll come to the combining data from different sources. This is very brief. If you have a diffraction pattern, you can combine it with other techniques. We'll hear about combining it with computational methods on the 7th of June. You can combine it with electron microscopy. Hear about that also on the 7th of June. But basically, you can com combine it with anything you like. Take your pick. What's your favorite uh, characterization technique for your type of material? Get that information in there. The hybrid methods seem to work best for this. So, I'm just going to leave you with the maze here. I hope you enjoy wending your way through it during the course of the next 10 days. And I hope to meet you in the corridors during those 10 days and see you in the center on the 11th of June. Thank you.
it's, it's different. It's <laughs> being tweaked, yes. <laughs> Again, just to identify yourselves, please. Yeah, I'm, uh, oh, hello. Uh, I'm Henrik from Stockholm University, and uh, I just like to ask you, uh, what software do you use for generating these electron density difference maps and uh, for scaling those uh, diffractograms? Okay. Um, the, I think most Retrofield programs will do this. We happen to use our homegrown Rietveld program, which is XRS, but I think most of the others will also do this. Um, it's, not, it's not magic, and it doesn't require a, sep a separate program, generally. I'm happy to hear from anybody else if uh, they know other programs better. <laughs> you can you can pick you can pick take the young folks first uh, if there are any other questions. Uh, thanks for a fantastic uh, lecture, uh, Joel Bernstein. I'm I'm sort of split. I have a split personality these days, half between Beersheba in Israel and Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I, 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 my my question, my comment really is is a little bit philosophical. I think you might remember the first edition of Stoughton Jensen. First edition of Stoughton Jensen in, in the section on, on uh, structure solution had a, actually had a chapter called Trial and Error Methods, which was deleted in the second edition. And, and I wonder if you're, I'm, I'm just very curious because, because model building, what you described as model building was very much the trial and error methods. And, if, and it, it's, it, sounds, it sounds much more creative and, and much wiser than trial and error, which sounds like you know, a, a lost man's uh, way of trying to find a way uh, to, to get there. Um, I just, just wonder how you feel about that. Yeah. If, if, you, if you consider a model building the replacement of trial and error methods. I suppose it is. Um, I will maintain that model building is the most, most powerful method we have at our disposal. When everything else fails, you can always try to build a model, and it's worth doing it. And structures is still solved this way. So uh, don't think you're going back to something very old-fashioned if you decide to build a model. A lot of the complicated structures are solved this way. And yeah, there's a certain amount of trial and error in there. Um, if you don't want to get too frustrated, you don't want to do too much trial and error. You want to think before you build the model. Hi, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Matteo, one of the orange scarf from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Um, you show a graph that say that in 2006 about 1,500 uh, structure were solved by Pader. Uh, more than the total number, do you have any idea about the successful ratio? Uh, you know, what's the rate of success of solving structure from powder? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, that's perhaps true of single crystals as well. You only hear about the ones that are solved. Uh, it's just a few more of them are solved, perhaps, than with powders. But I think we all have our drawer of unsolved structures. And every now and then, we take them out, dust them off, try again, because somebody's come up with a new method. Um, but I, I can't really say what the success ratio is. What, what if we push you further uh, on that and say, is it less than 50% in your own personal experience or greater than 50%? Uh, 
has the, I would say in our lab, it's probably greater than 50%. Uh, some are easy, some are difficult. And so I, I'm a bit reluctant to say. Uh, it depends very much on the substance. And at which point in the maze do you get stuck? Uh, in that maze there, there are many different branches, and uh, you know, where do you, if in the few percent that you actually don't solve, I mean, where do you typically get stuck? Is it at the indexing, or is it uh, at what point? Uh? Yeah, it's uh, often at indexing. Uh, indexing is, remains a problem. Uh, there are some marvelous programs, but they don't always take care of the problem. And so this is important. These are things we can control, but here we're relying on algorithms working on our materials cooperating, and they don't always. And of course, the structure solution algorithm, if you've got a very complex structure, uh, sometimes they just can't handle it. My name is uh, Habibur. I'm from Chalmers University. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Habibur, Chalmers University. My question is, can we uh, bypass this indexing and in space group in any way? Can we? Bypass this indexing and space groups in this uh, way of structure solution. Not very easily. You need a unit cell if you're going to solve a crystal structure because that is what gives you the periodicity which makes it a crystal. Um, I do know people who have used, said, I can't get the three-dimensional cell, um, but there's a, I can get a two-dimensional one and then build up from that. But in the end, you need the three-dimensional unit cell. So. Hi, um, it's Sporty. I work from I work for work at Pfizer. Um, I have a question. It relates back to the previous question. Um, I work a lot with index. Uh, sorry, with organic uh, drug molecules, and indexing isn't such a problem. But um, structure solution is. Uh, we use model building, and my personal success rate is zero. <laughs> I can index anything, but. Without, well, we, uh, I haven't solved the structure personally, but my colleagues have. But without single crystal data, we're unsure how good the, the solved structure from powder data is. Is there any way of uh, increasing your confidence in the structure that you've got from powder data? Yeah, sure. Uh, I guess like uh, single crystals, well, like protein, you have to validate your structure. The first validation is the Rietveld refinement. If your refinement is stable, mm -hmm. if you don't have to fiddle around with it, you can be more confident than uh, if you've done some things you really shouldn't do. <laughs> Which... Uh, happens all the time. Um, 
The other thing is the chemical sense of your structure in the end. How well does it uh, clarify other characterization techniques? These are all things that you should always do uh, when you've got a structure solution. I think particularly with the organics, uh, you have uh, some nasty polymorph problems. Uh, you often don't have diffraction to a high angle. Mm -hmm. And so you can, if you're a little bit sloppy, get drawn the wrong direction. So it's always useful to use other techniques to verify that what you have is correct. Okay, thank you. I would certainly echo that and we'll hear more later on in the week. The other thing I would say is I think we have to move beyond this, this notion of constantly questioning whether powders can actually deliver. The examples that I would there in the literature are there are many, many fold. Uh, and it's been shown again and again and again who, when, perform properly, good care for refinement. My name is Martin Schmidt, University of Frankfurt. Uh, just a comment and an answer to your question. Uh, generally, a read fill refinement gives you a very good idea. Generally, a read fill refinement gives you a very good idea of uh, if the structure is correct or not. And you can also make uh, lattice energy minimization. Okay, yeah, this is much better one. Okay, uh, Martin Stachowicz, University of Warsaw. Is it possible to find uh, modulation in the uh, structure from powder diffraction techniques? Well, I suppose the magnetic people do it all the time. Uh, magnetic structures often have modulation, and this is often done with powders. So, uh, other types of modulation, I'm not the expert here, but I would think in principle it's possible. In practice it may be difficult. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those uh, contributions.